The Lead Live is presented by Pint and Plow Brewing Company. Texas Hill Country Advisors. With support from K-Pub. Peterson Health. And Kirk County Abstract and Title Company. And now, from Pint and Plow on Clay Street in downtown Kerrville, this is the Lead Live with Lewis Amistad. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. And it's one of those days where you're trying to get everything kind of connected, and we're dealing with some issues this morning. But uh, good to have you here on a oh, what is today? Today is Monday. Monday. Make sure that I'm not uh, giving myself some feedback here. It is um, the day after the Christmas parade, or the day two days after the Christmas parade, and we have a lot to talk about. With that, the Kerr County Commissioner's Court is meeting currently, and we have, uh, we'll probably jump into there and see what they're going to talk about. It is uh, something else, though, to see what they're up there working on. And uh, other than that, we are, we are ready for the week. We are ready for the holiday. We're ready for basically everything else um, as we get ready for Christmas. Hard to believe it's already here. But, uh, yeah, it's exciting. And with that, let me get to some news and notes for you then today. Turn this down here. All right. Well, let me make sure I'm not having some feedback here. Feedback. Interesting. We'll make it work. I have a little bit of an echo. I'm going to try to figure out why that is. Just give me one quick second while I uh, deal with uh, the, a, the issue here. Give me one quick second. Stop it. Don't do that anymore. There we go. Okay, there we are. I think I got that fixed now. Um, nope, still getting uh, still getting that uh, piece in there. It's it's one of the joys of live streaming, is that you never really know what you're going to get on a certain day. You may get something where it's too loud for you. Let me turn that down a little bit. How's that for you? The chief is here. Eric Maloney is here. Um, one of the things that we uh, definitely want to talk about today is the fact that the the the, the parade was awesome. Um, it was an awesome event, uh, to say the least. And we, I mean, I just thought it was really, uh, you know, really well done. Hats off to everybody who was involved. And I think that there's a long list of people that were probably involved in this as well. When it comes down to um, you know th- how the parade was run. I, 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 guess, I guess I'm going to give it to Ashley Boyle over there at the city of Kerrville for getting it all done like that. I mean, it was really pretty impressive, and the 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 parade just ran smooth. There was just so much going on and so much fun with it. Uh, it just really worked out really really well. Um, the rest of the day this week, again, the commissioners' court is meeting right now, and that's going to be an important thing to talk about. We're going to kind of jump around with a couple of different topics this morning. Uh, while I try to figure out this other audio issue that I'm dealing with, it's always one thing or another. It just never seems to end. It's like run, it's not quite like running a fire department, but you know how that works. Like the other day, the chief was talking about how, you know, I, and I've seen this before. Like you go on in a call, and then suddenly a piece of equipment doesn't work. It's supposed to work. That's that, that's the deal for you, right, chief? I mean, I mean, every every so often you get that where you have, you go out on a uh, on on a on a call and either the radio doesn't work or a piece of equipment fails or something. I mean, that's that's kind of the deal, right? Yeah, it's something that we deal with and uh, have to work to. And so you got that Plan B. So what's Plan B? What's Plan B? And uh, I remember one time covering a story years ago uh, uh, where a gas station had exploded, and the the city uh, that I was covering um, had a pumper truck that came out. They're putting water on this and the, the, the truck basically seized up and stopped and basically melted down during this fire. 
and um, and it was like a you know even then you know that's three hundred fifty four hundred thousand dollar expense, and there was people from the city council that were there because it was such a big news story. They're like, oh boy, this is getting worse. You know? <laughs> I mean, to lose a piece of equipment in the fire uh, is that is harsh to deal with. So. Um, the chief is here. We want to ask him. This is the one of the things that I was going to ask you about was that this is the busy time of the year when it comes to Thanksgiving can always be either really great or really dangerous. And we have a stat out there that it's nineteen million dollars a year in damage related to turkey fires, and that's where people uh, either fry their turkey or they actually set their house on fire because they didn't know how to cook the turkey in the first place in the in the oven. That would be – that's something that's really uh, insane to think about as well. Uh, Chief, good morning. How are you? Good. Good this morning. Um, what is it uh, – have we ever had a turkey fire here in, 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 the, in town? Well, um, so I think when you look at turkey fryers, um, I, I want to be an advocate uh, for it, but I think, once again, you want to do it safely. Right. And that's probably the most important piece with this. Most of the – pretty much probably all of these fires are preventable. Right. So, and if it's predictable, it's preventable, therefore not, not an accident. So, I think it's an opportunity to take a look, uh, put something out this week in the paper on that, too, just how we can be a little safer if we want to fry a turkey, because right. it is Texas, so we're going to fry a turkey. Um, this morning, we wrote a story that uh, the National Fire Prevention Association um, put out uh, some stats that kind of leading up to uh, uh, the year that said, you know, that you this is the area you have to look at is it's very, very dangerous. Um, you know, here's here's some of the things they talked about. Thanksgiving is a peak day for home cooking fires with more than three times the daily average for such incidents. And you got to remember that like structure fires and house fires, that's pretty rare these days. You know, if you think about it. Um, I mean, they still happen. We don't want to diminish the value, of them, but that, that's something that we've, we've done a pretty good job of, like, recognizing that, you know, be careful out there. Christmas Day and Christmas Eve ranked second and third, with both having nearly twice the daily average. Um, U.S. Department, U.S. Fire Departments in 2019 responded to an estimated um, 1,400 home cooking fires on Thanksgiving, the peak day for such fires. Unattended cooking was by far the leading contrib contributing factor in cooking fire and fire deaths. Cooking caused 49% of all reported home fires and more than two of every five home fire injuries and is the second leading cause of home fire deaths, 20% uh, of them, in 2015 to 2019. So that's a pretty, that's a, that's a pretty, some pretty stark uh, numbers there, you know, like, hey, you need to be careful. Yeah, a grim reminder coming into the holidays of how things can go wrong real quickly. Right. So if you're not doing the prevention, I think that's one of the biggest things we do is really try to get that information out there to make it a safer holidays. It's a time to get together with family, but uh, things can go wrong real quick if you're not paying attention. It is the, uh, the you know, Thanksgiving is here on Thursday. Uh, we, we expect uh, everyone to have a great, great holiday. But it's a reminder, too, that it, it could be – there's there's household dangers. Not only is there cooking, there's there's choking hazards, there's people there, – there's something, you know, tied to the holidays with emotions and stress. Uh, and so there's a lot of things probably going to happen this, this week, and it's probably – you know, it's probably – a time where you want to be able to give your guys the day off, but at the same time, it's like, well, we got to be staffed up and get ready for that 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 weekend. Um, is is it hard to run a department during the holidays? I mean, or is it just everyone kind of understands this is I'm going to be working this weekend? So we work 24/7. Uh, so we run three shifts. So the guys understand that they'll be working Thanksgiving. So one out of the three years, and uh, that's part of what we do. So yeah. we maintain the same capacity to respond. Uh, here in the city of Kerrville and provide that same level of service. All right, we're talking to the chief. I got some things for him already planned. He's he's yeah. he's might, probably not looking forward to it, but we got things planned. No, it's actually all good. Um, I'm going to play a, a clip for him in a second here. I want to just check real quick. Uh, we're talking about the Kerr County Commissioner's Court. They are uh, meeting. Oh, look at this. Look at this. There, look who's, uh, look who's uh, there. Uh, Brenda Hughes and uh, Karen Guerrero are talking about uh, Kerrville Pets Alive. Um Interestingly enough, uh, the commissioners today, let me go to the live shot here. This is a live look in at the commissioner's court. They are going to talk about the ARPA funds. This is the American Recovery uh, Act um, that uh, this, the county basically is sort of said we're going to take this money. Now, the Harley Ballou there on the left, he's, he's saying that they don't want to take the money. Or he's, he's putting it out there that maybe taking the money is not just a good idea. 
The issue, though, is that if you really think about this, right, this county has accepted, I think, I think the number is more than $30 million in federal funding uh, from COVID repair, COVID, COVID care. Um, the commissioner's court uh, wants $10 million of that. Judge Kelly, I spoke to him last week, made the comment that, you know, basically thinks he's going to get the money. Uh, that they're going to get it done. Because there's a lot of things they can get done with that money. And part of that, that was, is one of the things he pointed out to me was that they could actually fix the Hill Country Youth Event Center's uh, uh, arena floor, which is dirt, right? And that dirt has been consumed by, uh, uh, it's been consumed by, you know, animal uh, feces, urine through the years. And so essentially it's created a toxic soup. Uh, in that in that facility, this, by the way, if you're watching this right now, um, this is Reagan Givens, who's the uh, head of the Kerr County Animal Services Department. The judge wants an explanation to him why the doors are locked uh, at the facility, uh, and there has been some pushback from people, most notably, I think Kerbal Pets Alive, saying we, we can't get in there, we don't, we we can't access them. They're not answering their 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 call, their doors. And uh, the judge put it out there that he wants to get to the bottom of this. Um, the animal control situation here is dependent upon the bond going through. But let's see what, uh, let's just take a minute here and let's listen to what uh, Reagan Givens is saying and, and hear what he has to say here. Unmute this. It's not viable that we do it. And I probably should have unlocked it a little bit sooner. But um, being able to lock it on occasion whenever we do have an outbreak or, or, or another situation where we think that it needs to be locked is good, um, but at this time, we went ahead and reopened. Good, good, good to know. Uh, any uh, information or anything you want to discuss about it? As far as the need for a new shelter? Well, we're working on that too. Well, uh, exactly, it shows the need for a new shelter because um, there's, a, there's, you know, you have a very active, uh, you have a very active group in Kerbal Pets Alive who they want to be able to help as much as possible um, and, and facilitate adoptions out of the facility and there's been some frustration I think that KCAS is just not available um, or does not make themselves available in most cases so that's the one that we're kind of uh, tracking um, right now uh, I, I'm assuming they are there's probably well it's hard to say if there's a full house there or not they have the door closed so um, generally that, that they would have a packed house for this conversation about um, the the funds. What does this guy want? Let's see. Let's hear what he let's see what he wants. What does he want? He's got a beard though for days. Holy smokes! He's already won no shave no, uh, November. Let's see what he wants. What does he want? Oh, we're playing a video of a YouTube video. Oh god, okay, whatever. We're not gonna watch that. All right, back to back to me. All right, so there you go. Uh, now. A couple other news stories that from the weekend uh, that I want to point out, and, I'm, and the Chief's going to have to maybe not listen to this part of it because he's already heard my spiel on this already, but he's going to have to hear it again. I'm not going to ask him to comment, but he's just going to have to listen to me y yammer. And if he, if he doesn't like it, he can just throw something at me. And I'm okay with that because we need our boundaries, and we need help in this community. We're all one community together, and we're working together to make things better. All right, there was another death from COVID-19. As you people have heard me op opine on this before, I'm going to say it again, that the state, in my opinion, does not count the deaths at Peterson, okay? So here's what happens, right? Um, Peterson had a death on Tuesday. And so being the reporter that I am, I want to find out for sure, did you mean to say that there was a death on, thir on, on Thursday or on Tuesday? And what happens is when Peterson has a death, they will mark that they will, change, they will add their own numbers to Kerr County's numbers, right, on their website. So going into Tuesday, we had 137 deaths, according to DSHS. Um, and so when Peterson has a death, they just add that number to it, right, 138. Okay, that was Tuesday. Well, if you follow this stuff, DSHS does not, does not acknowledge that number, right? So then they have a report of a death on 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 Saturday, right? We're making the death toll 138. Well, it looks like it's confirming Peterson. Oh, well, that, that, they've, they've counted that. No, they haven't. Because you have to go and download the spreadsheet that they put on the website to show you that that death actually happened back on November 8th. The Peterson death happened on the 16th. 
That's eight days later. It takes, it takes the state at least 10 days, if not longer, to acknowledge deaths. And the problem with this whole thing, this accounting thing is, is that we have, um, we, I've been tracking this, you know, from the start, right, is that you just really don't know what, what, what the, the true death toll is. And some people were like, you know, like, well, well, why do you bother with it? Why do you care? I'm like, well, I care because I think it's indicative of the fact that we have a much broader problem here than people let on. Let on. Um, and so, you know, there's that, there's that issue where you have folks who are just in total denial about the, the, this, this, vil this virus. And I've said it before. If you go back and you look at the data, and this will prove itself out when we, look, when, we, when we peel things back, you know, five or ten years later, you will really see how bad COVID really was when it came to, comes to, like, uh, mortality. The flu kills about one person a year in this county. Um, over the last 40 years, it's killed maybe less than 50 people. Uh, you can look at that. That's, that's, that, num that data is all collected, and it's available on, on publicly accessible websites. If you look in uh, August and September, right, we don't think of, 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 uh, of respiratory illnesses killing people in September and October. 40 people died, right? That's as many people died in two months as died from the flu in 40 years in Kerr County. Um, and so it's a pretty significant issue. And, and this is one that like, people are like, oh, well, you know, have people recovered? I'm like, oh, that's great. Yeah, you can have a lot of recoveries. That doesn't mean you can't get COVID again. And they can't kill you the second time because, b believe me, it's becoming more and more, you know, wicked as it gets along. So this is where we're at with this, you know. And so, so the point being is that what is our true death toll? So I believe right now it's like 199. Um, and um, that includes all the nursing home deaths. Uh, and my theory on that, and the, the chief's heard this before too, uh, and I don't, I don't need him to comment on it, but I just he, he's heard it. But my point is is that those deaths – were most likely brought in from somebody from Kirk County, right? If you look at that, right, those employees brought those brought that virus into those places. So you know, it's it's without question that 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 is part of the, the deal. And some of those folks, I mean, that's where they're living. You know, unfortunately, it's a, it's, it makes it, things look really really difficult. So remember, the state doesn't count the nursing home deaths, the deaths at uh, uh, the assisted living homes, the state hospital, the VA hospital, and I don't even know if I got all the VA ones right. I, I had four, and that was, uh, it's been a year since I checked. I need to probably go back and check again. So there you go. Now, listen, here's the deal. Um, if you were a man of a certain age, oh, one other quick thing, too, I'm sorry, uh, and then we'll get to the man of a certain age, because the chief and I are both, uh, we're both 1980s kids. Um, I, I think if I got this right, the chief graduated from high school in 1987. Is that correct? That is correct. That is Tybee correct. High School. Tybee High School. I'm an 89 grad. Uh, not a Tybee High School, but so we were kind of like, you know, I was a sophomore when he was a senior kind of thing. So I, I get that. Um, the 87 was a very good year, by the way. Uh, that was the year that U2's, rattle, uh, U2's uh, Joshua Tree came out. It was a good year. It was a very good year. So uh, a lot of things to think, think about there. The 80s were fabulous. Um, but... Um, I want to talk about just for the parade for a second. I'm pretty certain I can't prove this yet, but I'm going to. Clifton Pfeiffer may have cloned himself because here's the deal, and you might want to investigate this too because we might have a cloning experiment going on in, in town here. Clifton Pfeiffer was the grand marshal of the Christmas parade, and Clifton Pfeiffer was the third, was the second entry behind the ROTC kids, right? So here he is. So, so he's the second, second parade. And here's what actually has truly happened. He didn't clone himself. But it's more like a Roy Kent. If you've watched Ted Lasso, there's a, there's a, there's a filthy little song they sing about Roy Kent. Uh, Roy Kent, he's there, he's everywhere, he's every effing where, that kind of thing. You know, you get it? That's, that's Clifton Pfeiffer. So... Um, Clifton Pfeiffer gets off his off the uh, jeep that he was riding, was driven by Lisa Winters of Peterson Health. Somehow circles back and gets back on the Doyle Community Center float and finishes the ride on that one too. So he was on the he was on the flo he was on the parade twice. So a he's really quick. B he cloned himself. C he really loves parades. You can be can be deciding of that one as well. All right. So there's that. Um, 
the other one too was the city of uh, Kerrville's uh, parade float was awesome. I mean, it made a mess like you would not believe, but fortunately it kind of just evaporated and went away because it was full of bubbles and foam. Um, I th- they may have gotten the foam that you guys used for fight- fighting fires because it was all over the place. It was huge amounts of foam. <laughs> uh, and so there was foam everywhere. Uh, it was just a really great flow. It was really well lit. And four of the five city council members were on the float. Number five, place one guy, he was in the, on his own ride, which was like the optics of that seem a little weird, which I wrote about a little bit today. Um, the parade's not political. Uh, by not riding with the city council, you essentially made it political. And that's another whole story altogether. Um, that's th- the dynamic within the city council right now is strange. And that, to me, was signifying the fact that there is some, some issues there with the city council and that um, the optics were peculiar if you were really paying attention to that like like what I do. I pay attention to those things. Um, and so the parade has explicitly put out like you can't have you know, you cannot have political um, you know, messaging in the in the parade, which, you know, that, that, that's kind of hard to enforce. But basically that's the rule. We want this to be a Christmas parade. We want it to be a, a political that that's that's there, but you know you also had the Republican Party in the in the parade with their MAGA hats, and then you had Harley Blue, whose mustache has a political opinion, and so those are the things that are out there that were there. But really, the truth, the, the biggest political issue was Roman Garcia not riding with the city council, and then on his on his truck that he was riding, which was a pretty cool truck by the way, uh, very well done. Don't get me wrong, don't very well. He had his campaign signs, but he had covered up the four part. So it was Roman Garcia, Kerrville City Council, and then he had the four city council part covered up. So that got around the idea that you couldn't have political messaging uh, on there. And, uh, but it, felt, it just felt awkward to me because the city council was, was right behind him, and they were just sitting there waving at people as they should, and he could have fit. So there you go. Okay, that's men of a certain age, myself, the chief, there are certain sounds in this world uh, that we grew up with. Uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm not saying it correctly. Maybe I, I uh, maybe I don't. Maybe you didn't have that here. I don't know. But I, I'm suspecting you did. Uh, that you you had. Let me see if I can find. Where did this thing go? Here it is. Ha ha. That this sound on a Saturday night in the 1970s was one of the greatest things you had ever probably ever heard. And for me, I still hear this today. Station 51, KMG 365. 51104, KMG 365. LA clear, KMG 941. LA testing with stations 36, 45, 127. Squad 51 returning to quarters. There you go. Squad 51, engine 51, truck 9, truck 6, <laughs> battalion 16. I mean, that's the greatest thing ever. Like, when they, when they tone out, and for those of you who don't know, that's, the emer- that's Emergency. Uh, that was a show in the 70s, uh, Randolph Mantooth, and uh, what's the other guy? Uh, the other, other, anyway, about paramedics, it was produced by Jack Webb. Um, pretty accurate. Uh, it, it detailed the, the rise of paramedics, which you became a paramedic. Was this a show you got to watch when you were a kid? I mean, because you and I are, were men of a certain age, so this was a show that all of us watched as kids. Yeah, I remember some of it as a kid for watching that uh, with obviously uh, many other shows of the 70s uh, with police and fire. But yep. we used to show this. So um, I ran EMT basic class, uh, certification class. So I would play the beginning of emergency mm-hmm. about the first 30 minutes before if they wanted to bring dinner. So we used to watch the yeah. uh, the cl- or the or show, I guess, for a little bit there. So it was classic. It's, it's an absolute classic. It's interesting. Um, if you actually go to, and I have a picture of it here uh, pulled up. Uh, but it's interesting to me that, um, you know, Kerrville's unique, I, is, is cool in the fact that, um, you know, you have, you know, ambulances and paramedics together. In, in, in Los Angeles County, where this took place, here's the, here's the shot of it, 
they still they used a, a squad truck with the paramedics would ride, and then the ambulance would show up later, and then they would transport them to the hospital or take them to the hospital. In L.A. County, they still have that setup. They still have that. Like they won't. It's like so enculturated into their into their fire departments now that they, they can't bear to to depart from the emergency fifty one <laughs> squad truck. So you'll still see those all over the place. But I mean, the thing that's interesting about that show, though. And you being a paramedic first and foremost, uh, is that it, it, it raised awareness of what fire departments could do when it came to medical aids. And it, it changed the way that, you know, we, we, we see fire departments now. How would you uh, kind of assess the impact of that show and, and the work that you do? I mean, you're, you're, you're first and foremost, you probably would say, I'm a firefighter, but I'm, I'm a paramedic too. Right. So uh, that show was actually beginning of, I guess, uh, paramedicine or yeah. the pre-hospital care when paramedics actually started to really kind of come about uh, at that point. Yeah, I'm a firefighter and a paramedic uh, for the Kerbal Fire Department, 24 and a half years and i um, uh, been a part of that. But yeah, a lot of that, when you look at those squads, uh, large cities still run squads. Yeah, uh, You'll still see that out of Austin. You'll still, still see that out of San Antonio. It's those uh, non-transport trucks. So they, they squad, they, they um, make those early responses and then just see if they need transports from there. Uh, so kind of like a first responder, uh, what you see there. But a lot of changes actually over the years since then, but a lot of similarities. Yeah. Uh, still respond to the call. So still respond to the 911 call. The medical aid, um, we were talking about this a little bit before, the medical aid is kind of the heart of where you're at as far as, you know, your your, your interface with the public. Um, you know, how is that? How do you train for that? How do you work with the, how do you How do you recruit for that, you know? You're going to have to deal with people. You're going to have to, you know, work with folks. They're going to be sick. They're going to need your care. They're going to need your empathy. How, how does that, how does that uh, affect how you train and how you hire? Yeah, I think the last word you said there is the key of what we focus on is that empathy. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the biggest components that we look for in individuals who we bring to the Kerbal Fire Department because it is our community. It's a small community. We're not a part of San Antonio, so we are Kerrville and yeah. Kerr County. It's important. It's important for those who not just serve here, but, you know, I grew up here. My, my family's here. Right. And uh, so empathy is really what we uh, focus on. Training from there, really, when we look at the paramedic program itself, it's evolved uh, significantly since I went through it back in 95. And now that program itself is worth uh, 41 college credits. That oh, wow. They go through for about a year. It's three semesters is what they go through for the training for that. And it's uh, – uh, they are real close to re to obtaining uh, uh, associates in EMS. Is there is there a push for that? You know that 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 expand the level of education. <clears throat> it is a push from me, um, and it was my predecessor, uh, Chief Smith. Mm -hmm. So really, just try to encourage that because they're so close uh, yeah. to receiving that associate's degree, and it puts the paramedic. Uh, to a different level. Yeah. It brings in a different level of uh, professionalism and credibility. And so we, we really encourage that with everyone. And 18 hours is not very, uh, is really close for that. And most of it's your core classes. Right. You know, it's interesting. We were talking about uh, Chief Smith uh, before you got here. Jeremy Walter and I were talking about it. It's like the, the you know, the, the differences between the two of you are what, you know, as far as your style and, and your management style goes. Because he seems like kind of me like, oh, shucks, you know. <laughs> We'll get that fire out. No problem, everybody. <laughs> you know, but I mean, you know, you also, I remember I interviewed you when you got this job. You know, you said that he was uh, an important influence in your career. What, what was it like to work for him? And 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 what, what was it like now that you're on your own, you know? So Chief Smith was great. So actually, I've had the opportunity to be in administration part to work under Chief Holloway, Chief Ojeda, and Chief Smith. Mm -hmm. So got to three got to really see and work with three different styles mm -hmm. and uh, really kind of helped me kind of develop my own style, what we're looking for for the organization and really push that vision forward as a uh, kind of Kerrville Fire Department right. is what we're looking at. The, um, the, the interesting thing about Kerrville Fire Department is not only are you, uh, you know, basically locked in as the, the city fire department, but you also, you know, in the, the exp expanded extraterritorial jurisdiction, um, handling medical aids, you know, uh, in a broader sense of things. Does that make things challenging for that and working with the other departments, other the volunteer fire departments? No, I actually work in there. So we're, we're all hazards departments that so we provide fire protection, emergency management, of course, and mm -hmm. EMS. And uh, we work very closely with our volunteer fire departments in Kirk County. Uh, so they have a collective group uh, that they work together and we're a part of that group. So we, we meet with them every other month. Uh, we've done some training with them. 
and uh, we're definitely working to improve that in 2022. COVID has been a challenge with everything that mm -hmm. we do as far as getting together as a, an organization and bringing outside people as part of that. So we're going to expand that uh, in 2022 and looking forward to that. You know, let's go back to um, the, the pre-pandemic um, um, period, you know, early on in your career. Um, everything is pre-pandemic at this point. So the, the, we, had, we had September 11th and we had the pandemic. So we can measure our lives and these kind of 10-year increments. But, you know, you, you, did you want to be a firefighter early on? When did you know? So for me, actually, uh, interesting, and I won't get too much into it, but I actually grew up around the fire department. Okay. So my best friend, uh, his dad was assistant fire chief here. So uh, grew up in Kerrville South and just right. remember his car out front. So... Uh, I'm sure it was probably one of the old Crown Vicks, of right. course. Um, yes, the Crown Vic. I'm sure that's the classic one. So The Crown Vic is the greatest <laughs> public safety vehicle of all time. Ford needs to bring it back. So. Um, actually, you know, we, we asked, uh, we, we're, we're getting ready to do a story on it, if I can ever get it set up with, uh, with Jack there. But um, there's still two Crown Vicks in the fleet at the police department. And we asked Chief McCall, who we probably should have had on here too, by the way, but I, I failed on that one. Um, you know how he got into a crown vic because like it's not like this, he's a he's a he is a tall big muscular man and i can't imagine him fitting in uh, in that crown vic but he also said it was like it is a great car so yeah. um and, and getting in and getting out are probably two different conversations <laughs> for that yeah right, exactly. i'm six one and yeah. i strategically have to place myself when i'm standing next to right. Chief mccall and what is he, so. is he is he six four how big is he tell us how long is he i don't know i i very few i look up to and he i'm six one and he's there, definitely there's people out there in this world you just look you know. to yourself like my god you know i mean i remember seeing willie mcginnis one time who was uh played in the hall of famer for the for the new england patriots Seeing him one time in a college game, I think that's the largest person I've ever seen. And Chief McCall looks like a guy that could like he looks like he he looks like he could probably wrestle a bear <laughs> uh, and play offensive line, you know, for the for the for the Kansas City Chiefs, which they probably could have helped they helped last night. Um, but going back to being in the, the the fire department, the fire service as well. I mean, you know, a lot of times, like like my younger brother, and we mentioned I've mentioned this before, like we watched emergency religiously that was our that was our jam um and uh but he he he, he kept it with him for the rest of his life and uh, he went into the fire service kind of on that inspiration and then um you know fought brush fires and then went into be paramedic and so so he knew very early on that that's what he wanted to do was that the same kind of journey for you yeah, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, Chief Tennyson was a big inspiration, mm -hmm. so really kind of mentored me in this. Uh, I received my paramedic first uh, prior to getting my fire and was really looking kind of where the next step is, and, you know, he encouraged me to, to join the um, fire academy, and that was in 97, so wow. I joined that. And right. so and been a part of the Kerbal Fire Department in May of 1997. Did you so think you would stay in Kerbal? Did you did – you, did you yeah, that, this is my hometown. This I've, is your hometown. I've always wanted to be here. I, I have no, uh, really don't want to work for another anywhere else. I didn't want to go anywhere else. Yeah. The only place I ever looked at was Plano, but I think back in the day, everyone tested with Plano. Right. Uh, they, they were one of the top uh, departments in the nation to, doing things, but uh, I got back here and never looked back. I don't regret a second. Well, because Plano was probably, obviously, blown up. I mean, there's you've got all these corporate headquarters that are there now, and you've got, you know, significant growth, so... It makes it makes sense, you know. One of the things I noticed well, what would happen in Colorado when I was up there was that um, you know they had a lot of volunteer fire departments that were becoming professionalized because of oil and gas work. Um, is 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 the volunteer fire departments in Texas are they are they viable long term or do they need to have more professional firefighters? I mean, how do you you know as the, as the county grows and as the as the state grows, do you need to have more professional firefighters or? Is it always going to rely on those volunteers? No, I think volunteers are a key uh, to the fire service, and they definitely are not in the rural setting. Mm -hmm. uh, just due to the sheer numbers, due to the amount of funding it takes, uh, most of the funding that we have is the professional services for that. And I think some of the things you saw recently was the ESDs. Yeah. So for Centerpoint and for Hunt, that both came through. So that's four, I believe, four ESDs, Ingram, yeah. Mountain Home. And those two, which will be coming online, yeah. which helps them with funding down the road for their service, what right. they need to provide. Yeah, I mean, because the one was for Hunt, and then the other one was for kind of uh, Eastern Kerr County, you know, Center Point, all those areas which are going to see some growth, you know, at some point. 
uh, as well. When you look at um, the needs that you have, I mean, I, I've, I've been to st- uh, Station One. It feels pretty darn good. It feels pretty modern. Um, you know, you're working out of a out of a weird like former. I don't know what what some kind of dentist office at some point where you where you guys are at. So ours used to be uh, Kurt nine one one was in there, okay. and before that was Autophone. So they used to be in that. So now I'm dating myself <laughs> even farther back. Autophone uh, is like an answering service. It was an answering service back in the day. We actually used them on my oh, dad's wow. business back oh, in the wow. day. So, but um, yeah, so we're in a rented a lease building on the mm-hmm. western edge of Kerr. Um, the city limits, and so we're really working on that public safety complex, the public safety facility, working with the committee, uh, great work, and just look forward to that opportunity there to kind of bring us together, bring us more centralized for that, and so that's what we've been working toward. I was thinking about you last night. Um, we were talking about uh, uh, one of the things that you, you guys talked about on Tuesday at the workshop uh, for the city council was the need for new radios, which is a, a, a huge issue, and in fact, um, I, honestly, I, I told uh, – City Attorney Mike Hayes, I'm like, hey, you guys got off cheap with this one, $3 million. I mean, that's not bad. Because I was looking at it when I was in Greenville um, for those few months. They had the same issue where they had to replace their radio system. Again, a winter storm-related issue. Um, and the the winter storm issue there was, you know, it, it, it showed that you could not communicate between fire, police, and then public works was another issue too because the roads were such a mess from the storm so they were looking at a 10 million dollar purchase basically uh seven to ten because they had to replace towers and and buy buy property to put in towers things like i mean it was it was a bigger bigger deal but still a three million dollar incentive but i was watching last night as the situation unfolded in uh in uh wisconsin where the the person drove into the parade and one of the things you made you made clear was like in a mass casualty event, um, which you know we've had here, we've had it here just recently. We would have trouble communicating. We would have to run all of our operations through one, one channel. You have a two channel system now, a VHF channel or system in place now, quite antiquated. How dangerous and how frustrating is that situation now? Well, when you look at the channels, I guess, with the public safety uh, opportunities that we have, the VH system is, uh, it works. Um, it's kind of an antiquated system in regards to expandability that right. we can use for the emergency management. It's something we saw when, during the winter storm URI, and that it makes it more challenging to, to be able to operate with multiple agencies on there. The 700 on the megahertz, uh, you can really do those trunk systems. You can have different talk groups. Yeah. You could have a talk group for this show right here. Oh, I mean, that'd be perfect, so, yeah. Right? So, you can call right in. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So you can really work toward uh, bridging that uh, those gaps that you currently have with the VHS system by having talk groups. And so you can expand quickly on uh, an incident like that. Mm -hmm. So you can create those different talk groups. And I think that's one of the things that we're lacking, we're missing, are it's an aged infrastructure. And when we got looking at it with Chief McCall, and we both got looking at the opportunities that we have, one of those kind of he brought forward was that 700 megahertz, that trunk system. Right. So, and he worked with that up in Hobbs. Yeah. So he's very familiar with that. And, and, it, and it makes sense. You know, it makes sense. And I know this is an issue for a lot of a lot of departments across the country is that they have these antiquated radio systems. Um, it's an interesting conversation because, you know, I'm just going to uh, opine here for a quick second because it to me it's demonstrated the fact that we have a, a, a situation here in, in Kerrville and other parts of Texas where – We've sort of delayed things for a long time, um, and this 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 stuff adds up after a while. And three million dollars actually is probably three million dollars cheaper than it would have been to do this twenty five years ago. You know, where you would have had to have the massive consoles and all the other you know stuff just to make make it work. But it makes sense because you're going to improve the response for for things as well. I mean, so uh, I mean that just got to be that's got to be. A, a, a top of mind issue for both you and Chief McCall. Yeah, for both the fire department and for the police, uh, what our uh, capabilities are, are very limited right now. Mm-hmm. We we have workarounds. Uh, we always do. It's what we do in public safety, so we figure it out. That's that plan B. Yeah. So if it doesn't work, the the plan A, then we just move on until it works. Um, so we did that, and we did that during the winter storm. It was effe- it was effective. It just was not efficient. And um, so that when we were doing those multiple missions for there was a key one. We had four different missions going at one time, 
and the communication with them was very limited out there in the field. Where a system like this really improves that because you can separate those, we can hear very easily as incident commanders from emergency management and be able to communicate right. back uh, quickly and not impact police and fire operations, which has already taken place. I mean, we saw the increase with that. So you're still going to get those increased call numbers and those increased responses. So you can't impact that system. So One of the questions I, 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 I think that the winter storm, you know, I mean, people will say to me, like, I've, I've been through some blizzards and some nasty weather in my life, but I, I, I don't think that I've ever quite experienced something that was, like, if you really think about the winter storm, like how bad it really was. Like, it could have been a whole lot worse. You know, that, like, there was moments there, and I think, I think Mark McDaniel, the former city manager, talked about it a little bit, that they could have had failures in pumps and water could have been a problem. Um, it, what was your assessment of the winter storm? I mean, how, how did you – How did you? I mean, you've lived here your whole life. I mean, how, how gross was the winter storm? <laughs> um. You know? Haven't uh, haven't seen something like that before. Um, I do remember one back in the 80s, mm -hmm. a heavy snowstorm, I think a couple of days. But I think our biggest challenge with the winter storm was the power. Yeah. And when the power grid went down or was that rolling blackouts for there, that's when we started to see more and more issues start to uh, kind of compile. But I think we responded very well, very quickly. So identified those early and were able to kind of mi mitigate those before they came uh, to a head to too many problems. And it was, um, it was like a bad assessment is what I said. Uh, when we show up in the morning, we're, okay, it's going to be a great day. So the sun's going to come out. Oh, wait a second, it's snowing all day. It's like mm -hmm. someone would hand you yeah. <laughs> another card saying that's great, but here, now it's snow day. Now what are you going right. to do? And uh, so we were able to kind of group together and kind of re respond accordingly with that. One of the things I, 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 I've shared with people, I said, I mean, I look forward when it snowed because that meant I could actually get out of my driveway because I had traction for the first time in like three days because where I live, it was like a bobsled track. There was there was ice just everywhere, and I think that's one of the things that's fascinating about that storm was that um, I was talking to a, a guy, these tree trimmers, and they were like, "We're still working on winter storm recovery, you know, because we have so there's so many trees that are still down or or into things or messes made from it that they they, they can't keep up with the work. Um, the ice loads were incredible, you know, and and just driving in that stuff was just like I, do, I was afraid to get out of my because I have to go down South Way or go down, you know, oh. back behind Lehman, you know, and like those were those were all those were all bobsled courses. You know? <laughs> so I was like, uh, I'm I'm pretty good at handling myself in a vehicle, but mm, I'm not going to take any chances today. So I stayed home for the most part. Um, you know, one question I, I always think about, and this is my Californian coming into me, is that, you know, I've lived through many, many brush fires. And people don't realize, like, they think, to, they think themselves as the classic, go take care of your forest. And, like, well, it's not really what causes the fires. It's the dry brush. It's the interface with houses. I, is there ever a concern here about, you know, a prolonged drought and what it would do to cedar? Because is cedar oily and doesn't it blow up? I mean, what, 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 what kind of concerns do we have about some of our interface in our communities with, with vegetation and, and, and overgrowth? Yeah, everyone here is more in regards to brush fires. A little different than California, yeah. obviously, due to well, you have uh, a million and a half deer fires. To, yeah, to eat so. the eat the undergrowth <laughs> is helpful, you know. Yeah, but but cedars do explode pretty quickly uh, in the summer. We were fortunate. I think this last year we've had a couple of wet summers. Yeah. Uh, in regards to that, anyone who lived here back in oh geez, that would have been probably the early two thousands. Mm -hmm. We had the big brush fire up off uh, Shepherd Reese that okay. impacted the horizon. Is where it started and was. Temperatures were over 110 degrees. Oh wow! And uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a challenge. We have multiple multi agencies providing that, and it went down to Saddlewood. Um, the the interface is important, and when we talk about that wildland interface, or what you need to do is to kind of prepare your yard for that, is not let the trees grow up, not let the cedars grow up right up against your house, and making sure you keep the gutters clean, uh, yard picked up, and I think there's a lot of things you can do to kind of protect yourself. I know that's bigger in California, mm -hmm. of course, but uh, but there is de definitely here. And we're seeing that. We're yep. seeing developments go into the county. And when you're close to those cedars, if you've never seen, her, seen a cedar uh, light off, it's, um, it's pretty quick uh, for that one. Well, that's the thing. Like, I mean, I, I've never seen it. I've never seen one before. And I made a joke about it one time. And I was like, Doesn't it, don't they don't they explode? And it like, hit me. So, oh, no, that's not that big of a deal. I'm like, wait a minute here. I mean, I've seen a eucalyptus tree explode, you know. Um, 
uh, it's it's terrifying, you know. And and so like you know sometimes you have that weird mix here, of gusty winds and dry conditions. You know, fortunately here, you know, the one thing about I like about here is we have a little bit of the mix, the humidity. We have that summer rain. We have that monsoonal type of moisture that comes through that kind of keeps things kind of kind of kind of moist. But and then you also have, you know, all the deer, honestly, that, that kind of help mitigate some of that, you know, although they're kind of picky eaters, though. They're kind of a pain, or quite frankly. So and they have COVID, which is another issue altogether. Um, speaking of COVID, the COVID-19 challenge has been what for the department? What has it been for you guys to be deal with COVID-19? So we've been managing that, I guess, uh, it's hard to believe, about a year and a half. I know, almost two there. years. Yeah. yeah, and the biggest challenge I think that we've had is just uh, we've done very well keeping out of the department. We've done a lot of testing before they come to ship. Uh, that's been the biggest, I think, challenge for us is making sure we kind of mitigate that to protect our guys. And our biggest challenge is the guys uh, live together 24 hours. Mm-hmm. So we have five guys in the station. We have to keep COVID out of the station or we could lose five guys real quickly that yeah. could be on quarantine or isolation. So that's probably been the w- biggest challenge is keeping the integrity of the shift and making sure we keep our guys here because once they're out, we maintain a capacity to respond. So that puts pressure on the other uh, the other guys from the other shifts to work that over time and work those shifts. So it's been a long year and a half. It's been long. One of the things that I'm always mystified by is that the, I, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to put my head around this idea. One time I saw a guy get told to leave a football field it was cold outside he was very warm very big heavy jacket on and it was when we had mask mandates still you know or we had masking it was on a private property and they, they told him to wear a mask and the guy said that doesn't work and i thought about going over to the guy and said well neither does your coat either dummy you know just because you can't you know you can't see the cold but you know it's cold you can't see covid but it's out there and it's a little bit of protection is going to help there seems, though, to be a st- strong reluctance to get vaccinated in our public safety departments. Do you do you have that situation, or how do you manage that? Um, I think it's the same uh, across the board. Mm-hmm. So we see that in fire EMS and the healthcare too, um, in regards to the numbers, and it's pretty much standard, probably right around the fifty percent mark is yeah. what you look at. A lot of contracted it too, so there's that natural immunity. So where's that conversation? But, but it is a challenge in regards to receiving that. I think a lot of it just comes from the information that you're trying to, uh, trying to gather about the vaccine and trying to make sure you get the right information right. there is the key. So, and making sure we get that to the public and yeah. protecting ourselves. I mean, I'm fully vaccinated, so I received two on there. But um, I've also been unfortunate to actually uh, contract COVID so oh, right. early prior to vaccines. Prior to vaccines. So, and did definitely it, did don't it, want to do that again. So. so you had it, um, you know, and uh, did it did it knock you out or, did you, or was it mild? No, it was bad. Was so it? Um, it was bad enough for me. It was um, probably the sickest I remember since um, in years. And that uh, that morning, probably day five, almost went to the emergency department oh, really? for that one. So I didn't if I didn't get better, my wife was going to take me is what she said. Yeah. And that morning I was a little better. I got up, walked every day and. I think you talk about the deaths and just kind of, I think this is kind of a segue into it. It's, it's everyone in between too. So those that have contracted, even my concern when I had my physical was to get a chest x-ray. What is the long-term impact of this, of those, we, we talk about the deaths, of course, but there's also that percentage in there, the long haulers, the people that have contracted this that will have long-term impacts that survived it. And right. they still uh, are dealing with that. And I think that's one of the biggest biggest non-talking yeah. uh, points right now and you're going to see it d- down the road it's yeah. the chicken pox to the shingles it's well yeah i mean that's the thing that i think that i look at too like that's that's the i was telling my wife the other day i said there's a couple things in there that i'm going to get vaccinated for i i uh when i when i i I'd, I'd had the flu really bad several years ago which turned into pneumonia uh and i was so sick uh my, my, actually, my wife's mandate was my mother said she's gonna come up, come and take care of me. My mother, my wife said, you better get better tomorrow, and I did. So my mother couldn't come up and spend time with us. But that was another story altogether. But I was so sick. I uh, remember I was actually trying to work, you know, which is part of our our mantra. Like, oh, we we you know, I'm sick. I'm gonna work through this, and I, I could not. I was up on a press box filming a football game. I could not get down. I could not physically get down. I had to have somebody come up and help me get down. And I drove, uh, I drove. And so I was so sick from that that I was out for days. 
And um, after I battle, I'm like, no more of this. I'm going to get the flu shot. I've had the flu shot every year. But that shingles one. <laughs> <laughs> I turned 50 this year. I was like, let's get the shingles. Because <laughs> I know people who've had shingles. I'm like, you look really miserable. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And so th- there's that. But this thing with the, with the COVID vaccine, though, you're absolutely right, you know, in the, in the long haulers as well. Uh, on my chest x-rays they, w- from the flu, they don't know if it was the flu necessarily or maybe even something like something else because I have scarring on my lungs from that, that incident. And uh, it's left some permanent damage. So that's one reason like, I was like, well, I, I don't want to get COVID, you know, because who knows what it will do to me because I might have some underlying conditions, you know, that, that might go, it might go after. Um, did, you, did you lose your smell? I did not. So my taste was adjusted just a little bit. Yeah. I noticed that afterwards, but uh, I didn't lose the smell or all the taste. Um, had a couple. I know a couple people that actually lost that for months. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, mine was I was really sick. I mean, yeah. really sick. Couldn't get up. It's like it's the one of the ones you wake up an hour later. You're like, what time is it? It's only been an hour. You're like, oh, no. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's it. That's <laughs> it. So I got to try to go back to sleep, yeah. sleep it through. Right. So, yeah, I guess that'd be the only way to kind of kind of deal with it. It's such a it's such a it, it affects people so differently. Um, and I, I was reading somebody was talking about how it just doesn't feel the same like anything else. And like, honestly, that's one. I don't want to feel. I don't want to feel it ever. I don't want to, I don't want to have anything to do with it at all. So um, I like uh, being able to talk to folks. Uh, we're talking to Chief Maloney. Uh, the original purpose of this conversation was to actually talk about things that people do that are dumb uh, in the world. Like, like here, 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 let me back this up. This is, this is actually, this is turkey, fire, turkey fires of, of, of great danger. This is why you should probably... Well, the National Fire Prevention Association recommends not cooking turkeys this way. Yeah, that's not a good idea. Looks a little well done. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Oh, my. Oh. Yeah, that could kill you. (laughs) What an idiot. That turkey better be dry. You know, but it's a, you know, I, I, I get, and you, you said it before, I get why people wanted fried turkey. It's pretty good. Fried turkey is really good. So, and uh, I, you know, and so that's where one, um, I've had it and uh, I was going to do one this year. So to fry turkey, I'll smoke one. I won't, yeah. I won't bank Thanksgiving on the whole thing. My, my, my sister will make something a lot larger. So I'm kind of the smaller, the smaller one, one right. for that. Yeah. So just in case something goes wrong, <laughs> so the whole family's not looking at me. But um, it, it's really safety, and I really think most people kind of misunderstand when they want to fry a turkey, yeah. that they go out, they buy it, they go, okay, I'm going to do it just like in the oven, so I'm going to brine it, or I'm going to just put it in there. It can't be frozen. got to be 100% default. Cannot brine it, so you don't want any of that water. When you're talking about 350-degree oil and water, don't mix. And yeah. It's an explosive, uh, as you saw there on the videos with that, and you can real easily lead to fire. 10 feet away from a structure and it makes a mess i mean it just makes a mess and um it's one of those it's one of those things that i think um great but you have to read about it you have to make sure that you're doing things correctly for there that you didn't measure the oil that you know you have to measure the oil if you don't measure it it's going to boil over yeah you have an open flame down below with yep. oil peanut oil coming over right once again so it's a big mess with everything and trying to it can real quickly turn, uh, ruin your holiday. It's just a mess in general. That's for sure. <clears throat> so um, this year, actually, so I, after doing this, I yeah. did the article, and um, a lot of the safety components reading through it, and my turkey fryer is too old, so I was going to get a new one. <laughs> um, so after reading through this, I actually bought an airless fryer, yeah. and some of the guys at the department had that, and they said it is just as good as the oil for that with less the mess and less the risk. So I actually went out and bought one on Friday. I went out and nice. uh, I got one. So I'll, I'll let you know. I'm going to do that on Thursday. I'm going to try it out for the first time. All right. And uh, so you know, a lot less risk with that and a lot less mess. Well, you know, here's the thing, right? I mean, so historically, we know this is a fact that um, firefighters know how to cook. How would you rate the cooking experiences of the Kerrville Fire Department? How would they, how would they stack up? Is there, uh-huh. is there an expert cook in the, in the department? 
typically every ship or every station has one there. I had one when I was in the station. So yeah. you either learn how to cook or you learn how to do dishes. Right. Um, and so, but you learn from somebody and it's just kind of passed down. You learn how to cook for five. Actually, we cook for always more than that. Um, and you just become, you become good at it. And so now for me, I like cooking for the family get togethers because I can cook for the 15 people very easily because <laughs> it's like cooking for five at the station. Right, exactly. You know, you, <laughs> so, know, how, to, you know how to do it. Uh, you, you do. And, and you really have to learn with that. So there's always someone at every station that that can cook. That is really that guy go to. As a fire so. chief, though, you don't, you don't, you, you work five days a week, but you're pretty much on all, all the time, though. You don't have to stay at the station anymore, though, do you? You get to go home and sleep in your own bed. I do. That's one so. of the perks of it. Yes. So, so I, I do not work the ship work. So, where they work the 24 hours on duty off for 48 so but i am on call so or i'm available um you know are you experiencing and we're almost out of time here but i wanted to ask this are you experiencing um some of the challenges that others are experiencing when it comes to hiring or is there still that sort of you know i mean firefighting historically has always been a difficult job to get into um because it's competitive um because of the, the physical fitness requirements do, are you are you having any struggles, or are you are you pretty much meeting those 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 needs now? No, we're still struggling. Mm-hmm. So it's across the board. It's not just uh, Kerrville. Um, it's a state. It's a nationwide issue, mm-hmm. and really, it leads more with the paramedic is the challenge to find the paramedics. There was a significant decrease in number of paramedics out there from COVID you know, that have changed uh, professions and chose to get into something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of money where they've been chasing that, either with the oil industry um, or with the COVID uh, relief that people have gotten out and gotten into something else, or they just didn't want to deal with the pandemic anymore. Right. So, so that shortage makes it a bigger challenge for that. So ours, really what we really work toward in our long-term goal is really focus on our local. So our local is our key to our success as an organization. Uh, putting the Kerrville back in Kerrville Fire Department is really what we want to do mm-hmm. and really get those that have that best initiative in our community. Um, I grew up here, so I've been part of this uh, department. I have no intention of going anywhere else uh, with, with my career. And uh, so we want to kind of mentor those same individuals that are coming out of the school. And we right. have some of those. Right. And so we're really trying to try to really build on that. Because being a firefighter, I mean, to me, is like one of those. I mean, to me, I always felt like it, and I'm biased because, like I said, my younger brother's a firefighter. Um, I'm proud of the work that he's that he he does in his career, and you know. But it's a prestige job to me. It still is. It's like you look at the you look at you know the guys you trust in the community, the guys who, you know. I mean, everyone's flawed, but I mean, the guys that I grew up with, like one of my best friends' dad was a firefighter, you know, and it was like, let's go see the fire station, you know. Like I still get that sort of like. Um, kid kind of fascination with the fire stations and the fire trucks and you know I still like to see it you know I mean like Turtle Creek like you know rolled out this their massive fire engine they had you know this is like a super tanker on wheels um, and I was like fascinated by it I was fascinated by you know Santa Claus running down the thing I mean it's, I love photographing that stuff too um, what does it mean to you though I mean is it a prestige job is it is it is it I mean, how does it, how, how is it in your heart, I guess, m- more than anything? For me, um, I love serving my community. I love yeah. being a part of that. It's uh, it's an awesome experience to be able to do that. There, there are some hardships with knowing a lot of people in this town, too, because you also see the bad side of that. Yeah. And I've run on people that have been friends of mine uh, over the years. And so it is a challenge. Uh, Kerbal Park, the Kerbal Fire Department's unique. It's probably one of the best departments you'll ever see. Uh, in the state as far as what we are our family kind of that fire family atmosphere of yeah. what we do and how we serve both as firefighters as paramedics and that whole hazards approach how we work together as a team and so i'm pretty blessed to work for such an um, uh, awesome organization for that and great group of uh, men and women that just continue to serve this community and right when you talk about one of the things that i was just, have all these questions kind of come up in my percolating now that i'm thinking about these things is that you know one of the things that you'd mentioned before we talked about empathy before um you know we've also one of the things i'm i'm a big believer in too or uh, i think you have to be careful with is compassion fatigue you know how do you help you know how, how does a department navigate some of the mental health needs of your you know one of the things i think that's very difficult for firefighters sometimes to deal with is trauma you know of of uh, like anybody who can go in and help somebody who's critically injured is amazing in my book but there also is a mental and a emotional toll on that. How do you how do you help manage that that piece of that? 
So we manage that some uh, internally. So what we'll do some what they call a diffusing. Mm-hmm. So we that's like a peer driven for those high um, those not the I wouldn't say high risk, but those calls that are just. Um, not like the MCI mm-hmm. that we had or the mass yeah, casualty right. at the airport. So bring somebody in or we'll bring somebody in externally. So we have a good group in the San Antonio area that comes out and uh, just provides that mental support there. It's a long career. And I always tell the guys that, that are starting this and just did last week uh, alone that it's a, it's a long career. And you have to take care of yourself both physically and mentally to right. kind of prepare yourself for this because the things you're going to see are, are not normal and you shouldn't. Be, you shouldn't be okay with everything, and you should talk about that. And so we work together as a group. Uh, we do it at the kitchen table, so we'll talk together, and we just always make sure that we're taking care of each other. At what point in your career did you realize this was an important part of you know, that discussion, that group discussion, or that peer-to-peer sort of counseling in some ways? Was, was that something that was talked about early on, or did it, it's more of a, a recent recent? Uh, uh, Piece. No, so for, for me, it is kind of uh, sometime, I guess, that, that mental health or it kind of can be a little bit of a stigma or that kind of taboo conversation. Mm-hmm. So I've been a part of the critical incident stress management team probably since uh, probably since 2004. I'm not anymore because I was chief. I'm not a part of that right. as a peer. But uh, so we used to be a part of that and provide that provide that internally and really learned a lot through that process. The importance of that, because sometimes you can you can get a little bit of a stigma that, you know, you just need to kind of bottle it up and you do not need to do that. Right. And, and, and for what we see. So this is that out allows that conversation, that that open conversation. And so we have uh, four people on a team now. So set, we set that back up uh, with COVID. So we had two and we're getting two more trained for that and kind of helps that relief, that mechanism there. Which is really important. Yeah, I mean, it's so it's so important too because some, you know some of the challenges that you know you face is that you know you could be like you know just uncaring or un, you know un, not sympathetic to somebody as well, and, and this is a community too with a heavy retirement community. You have a lot of people out there who need service. Need you know, I'm sure your paramedics are probably running multiple calls a day. What what is the volume like? You know, as far as the calls you're 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 dealing with. So for last year, so for the last 12 months, just to the report, we did over 10,000 wow. uh, calls for fire, first responder, and EMS. Uh, first time that we broke the 10,000 mark uh, for the Kerrville Fire Department. Wow. And so, yes, uh, the, the call volumes there and managing that, and it, it can be difficult. Mm-hmm. It can be difficult because you're running a call back to back. Um, and but you have to treat everyone with empathy. Everyone, somebody's parent, uh, grandparent, as somebody always told me but back in the day, and be able to manage that for the, that 30 minute. It isn't the fact of uh, that I know all the medications or I know I'm the best IV guy. It's how you talk to people, how you provide care for people is more important than anything. Yeah. Because those are the ones that probably need you the most at that time because it's their emergency. And we see a small window into somebody's life. I'm there for 15, 20 minutes when I can make a big impact in order to kind of help them down the road and into recovery. Nobody wants to go to the hospital. Right. So, But the things I do and how I treat people is really important because that will resonate and that will help them toward their recovery right too. So. yeah it's interesting too one of the stories and we're, we're, we're out of time we're over time but i always wanted to say this too that one of the stories i've always wanted to do is you know one of the i think probably one of the most common ones you have to deal with is falls you know um and and you know falls are are so um important to to treat you know initially because it could lead to other things you know down the road um and you know, really, it's it's probably one of the biggest, you know, one of the biggest public health issues out there is, you know, uh, especially in our community where you have so many elderly, com- you know, people. Like a fall could end your life in in several ways as well. You know, you could get you could get you know people with broken hips. You know, how do you move them? How do they get to the phone? How do they how do they if they're by themselves? There's so many issues like that as well. Is am, am I wrong there, or what, what? What is your assessment of that? No, that you're you're spot on there. Mm-hmm. So falls for us, probably about twenty percent of our call volume is yeah. from falls, and you can quickly change somebody's activity of daily living, 
and you can impact their life down the road for that. Uh, Peterson has a great program, the Dieter Center too, about falls prevention, mm -hmm. something that we need to continue to do more and, and emphasize, because there's things you can do in your home to prevent that. And that may be another conversation to come back yeah. here and bring somebody in from Peterson or yeah. Dieter and kind of talk about what we can do as a, as a community to prevent that, because yes, it, it can significantly impact uh, your health and, and well-being. All right, I've, I've consumed this man's time. He's got important things to do. Uh, there were so many questions we could have asked him but we didn't we left it for another time um, things he's gonna be dealing with though the public safety building is still under consideration and conversation that you're heavily involved with now we need new radios uh, we need to continue to recruit firefighters and paramedics especially but also please if you're gonna fry a turkey don't do it I'm telling you right now I know this is an unpopular theory but I'm telling you right now Texas listen I know you like your brisket. I get it. I understand. I love beef myself, but I'm telling you, the real treasure in Texas barbecue is smoked turkey. I'm telling you. Sorry. An right. airless, airless, airless fryer. So airless, I'm going to keep an, you posted. An, an airless fryer. I want to know all about this one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to talk my wife into one of those, too, so I could, I could already, could already, you know. And you know what? It might be better for your cholesterol, too. There, See, there this, we're definitely men of a certain age. We're talking about our cholesterol. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us today on today's show. Tomorrow we'll have the folks from Cartwheels on, and they will be telling us all about uh, some of their things they've got going on, uh, catering for the holidays, things to remember for the holidays. Um, they will also be talking gluten-free, my favorite conversation, because uh, – uh, and by the way, if anybody ever says to you, is gluten-free, gluten is that a choice, or is that a, a, a preference, or is that because of an allergy? You say – why would I ever want to eat something that's gluten-free if I didn't have to? Come on now. So that will be part of our conversation on uh, on, uh, on 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 Tuesday. And then Wednesday, uh, Mike Kelleher will be here to join us. So join us uh, on Wednesday to talk about what's going on at Arcadia Live. Thursday, we'll be live from the Salvation Army, from the Croc Center as we celebrate Thanksgiving. No show on Friday. We're taking the day off on Friday because, you know what, there's a lot of good football on Friday, and I don't really want to spend time talking to you people and even watching football. And by the way, the NFL is awesome. I'm telling you right now, if you people who don't like the NFL, you're crazy. It's the best it's ever been. There's terrible teams like the Houston Texans that can go and beat the Tennessee Titans who have beaten everybody else. There was a game last night between the Chargers and the uh, Steelers that was fabulous on, on, on Sunday Night Football. Uh, the Cowboys and uh, Chiefs played a hell of a game uh, uh, you know, yesterday. I mean, it's just fun. I don't, I, I tell you, I don't know who's going to win the NFL or the Super Bowl this year. I cannot tell you. I mean, the Cardinals? What? No. They can't win the Super Bowl. They're not allowed. Kyler Murray's hurt. Uh, so, I don't know. Football is just fabulous. So, anyway, enjoy that. Uh, in fact, there's a great game on Friday, on Thursday, uh, Thursday night. It's the Bills and the Saints, uh, and that's going to be a good one too. So uh, a lot going on. All right, everybody, thanks a lot for joining us. We'll see you guys uh, again tomorrow.